welcome to the great detectives of old time radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do want to uh, encourage you, if you enjoy this podcast, to be sure and uh, follow it or subscribe to it using your favorite podcast software, including Spotify, Apple, Podcast Stitcher, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. I also want to encourage you to check out our other podcast, and I want to highlight our World War II podcast, The War which is a series that follows the trajectory of America from the pre-war era through the war into the post-war era through music, news programs, drama, and comedy. You can check out The War at thewar.greatdetectives.net or find all the other podcasts that I've done over at greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for this week's episodes of Dr. Tim Detective. From April 24th, 1950, we have Poisoner at Large. And then from May the 15th, 1950, we have The Man from Hiroshima. This is Dr. Tim Detective to bring you by transcription, The Mystery of the Poisoner at Large. It isn't very often these days that you run across a case of wholesale poisoning. But when you do, well, there's never a dull moment until you've tracked the whole thing down. There's nothing worse than to be poisoned, whether you take the wrong medicine out of your medicine cabinet by mistake, or whether it's fed to you by somebody else, as it was in this particular case which came to my attention not so long ago. But I'd better start right at the beginning. Sandy and Jill, they're a couple of my very best friends and helpers, were watching me at work in my laboratory this particular evening, and, as usual, the questions flew thick and fast. Sure, I get the general idea, but what's that machine for? It sure makes enough racket. Well, as I was saying, it's called a centrifuge. Uh Uh-huh. That explains everything, I guess. Yeah. I can see it just about as easy as a black sheep in a coal mine. (laughs) At night. (laughs) Okay, kids. I'll back up a little. You see... When you have several kinds of bacteria, or bugs, I guess you'd call them, or when you want to separate one part of a substance from another, you put them in a centrifuge, turn on the switch, and the machine whirls them around at a few thousand revolutions per minute. Then what happens? Presto, like this. Centrifuge separates the lighter from the heavier parts. In this case, the bacteria I'm hoping to find from the solution they grew in. And, well, here you are. Look for yourselves. Hey, it works. I'll be done. Well, uh... Transfer these bacteria to a culture. Here we go again. Well, a culture is merely something for the bacteria to grow in and feed from. Oh. In this case, I'm going to use the fertilized egg of a chicken. And if the experiment works, I'll soon know if these bacteria can live and grow in living tissue. At other times, the culture might be uh, milk or a sugar solution. Or even a bit of custard pie. It's a way we scientific detectives have of finding out a lot of things. Mm, I don't see much detective work there. Yeah, you'd be surprised, Sandy. You'd be surprised. Uh, uh, uh. Hello. Hello, Tim. Is that you? Oh, hello, Jarvis. How are things down at the health department? Well, we can sure use you right now if you've got the time. Uh, we're pretty short-handed and something's come up I don't like at all. Right in your neighborhood. Well, anything serious? Fourteen calls during the last hour. And all from your part of town. Food poisoning, I think. Hmm. Any clues? Not yet. Haven't had time to check thoroughly. Thought you might help there. I can get out your set of pulse massages and do a little detective work. Why, Doctor Jarvis, you know us junior G men have given up disguises. The latest thing is to graft noses on us like a bloodhound. <laughs> All right, any way you please. Now I'll give you a list of the names and addresses of everybody we have that's been reported so far. And that you get work. A few minutes later, Sandy, Jill, and I were mapping out our campaign. 
Now, some people think it's kind of funny for a combination doctor and detective to count on a couple of kids for help on a case. But let me tell you that those two are just about the most valuable assistants I have. In between phone calls reporting new cases of food poisoning, we outlined the problem and our work. So you mean you'd like us to get a complete list of everything the sick people ate today? Exactly. And then by putting those lists together, we ought to find that all of them had one kind of food somewhere along the line. Or ate at the same restaurant, perhaps. In other words, you see, we need a common factor to start with. I get it. You're trying to track down where the food poisoning came from. Exactly. And that way, we can stop anyone else from eating the contaminated food. But gee, what is it? Arsenic or, or rat poison or something? Well, that's what I'm going to find out by a careful laboratory analysis after I visit a couple of those sick people. However, I'm willing to bet that we'll find our old friends, the bacteria, at the bottom of it. Germs, huh? Yes. Well, let's get going, kids. Milk and canned soup and cream pie. Oh, yes. Dr. Kim would like to know where you bought the pie or if you... Let's see if I have it right, Miss Greta. You and your wife ate hamburgers, canned pork and beans, and drank coffee. Dr. Kim told me to ask you where you bought the hamburgers. The rest of the things don't matter. You didn't eat anything at home, is that right? Now, I'm supposed to find out a quick restaurant you ate. Thanks. Now, let's be sure I have it right. Steaks, potatoes, fresh carrots, and chocolate clear. You sure that's everything? Dr. Kim wants to be sure. By the time I arrived home after looking in on some of the patients, I had enough laboratory material to keep me busy for quite a spell. Samples of food from several homes, minute bits of waste from the patients, and lists similar to those Sandy and Jill were compiling. I went into my laboratory and sat down for a few moments to think. So far, nothing about the case made sense. Except that all those people did have food poisoning. No doubt about that. And some of them were mighty sick indeed. There'd be a lot more if we didn't track down the source of the trouble in a hurry. Stop anyone else from eating the germ-laden food. Silently, I went to work. A few minutes later, Sandy and Jill were going over their lists of the food eaten by the poisoned patients with Dr. Jarvis. And as I adjusted my microscope for the umpteenth time, I found what I was looking for. I motioned the others over. Well, here's the criminal. See, let me see. Yeah, me too. They all peered into the microscope. Dr. Jarvis was the first to speak. Oh, nasty little germ, Salmonella. What Salmonella? I suppose it accounts for more food poisoning than all the other bacteria put together doesn't kill very many people. It sure makes a lot of them plenty sick. Did you find out where it came from? Unfortunately, no. There aren't any samples of the food I've tested so far that show its presence. The bacteria you see under the microscope are from the stomach contents of one of the patients. Well, we're not having too much luck ourselves. Like to hear the reports of the investigation? I think that's the next step. Okay, Jill, you've been keeping score. I suppose you start. Well, there isn't any one food that everybody ate. No. Wouldn't you know it? Oh, it's worse than that. There aren't even two kinds of food on everybody's list. I mean, you know, half of them one thing and half another. Mm -hmm. It just plain doesn't make sense. It looks like a dead end from here. Well, let's do the best we can. Let's find the, say, the three items that appear oftenest in the list you've made. And this might be a connection. First, though, I think we can rule out canned food, because there hasn't been any real trouble with commercially canned food for years. And it's impossible that all those people ate the same home canned stuff that might have gone bad. <sighs> this is going to be tougher than I thought. The results of our detective work were peculiar, to say the least. But we did prove one thing. There were three food items to be suspected. Because one of those three appeared in all the diets of the ones who ate at home. With a flourish of his pencil, Dr. Jarvis summed it up. Well, here we are. Those poisoned people had either hamburger in some form, cream pie, or chocolate eclairs. 
Doesn't make sense. Wait a minute. I've got an idea. I've been working in the ones who laid out, and all of them had one of those two. Hold on a minute. Wait till you hear this one. I've been doing the stores and the restaurants. Everybody that ate out went to the drugstore down on the corner. This is beginning to add up to something. Let me see your list, Joe. No, 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 the other one. Uh-huh. All the pastry, the cream pies, and the chocolate eclairs came from one bakery. Oh, sure, and we have meatballs, hamburgers, meatballs, and tamale pie, all made with ground meat from the same butcher shop. You're sure of that? Uh-huh. Uh, now all we have to do is to chase all over town to those various stores, trying to find out what and why. Gosh, right? no, you don't. Don't what? Don't have to chase all over town, or even this end of it. That bakery and the meat market and the drugstore where the people ate are all right together. Just four blocks down the street. Say, wait a minute. If, if that's true, Jarvis, I think we might have the answer. Let's get going. Fast. Come on, let's go. Come on. As we drove the short distance to the shopping center, I got to think. You know, it's a funny thing about mysteries, especially complicated ones like this one, where people scattered over a wide area all come down with the same illness at once. At first, things don't even make sense. Look impossible, you might say. And then, with a bit of information added here and there, a dim pattern begins to take shape. Well, that's exactly what happened in the poison mystery this time. Here's what we knew. Three food items caused those people to become deathly ill. Well, two, really. Because it occurred to me that the filling of cream pie and the filling of chocolate eclairs is the same. And the other was hamburger. Both items came from the same two stores. Those who had eaten at the drugstore had eaten either hamburger or the cream filling. What would be more logical than for the drugstore food to be purchased at the butcher shop next door and the bakery two doors down? So the pattern was now clear. Only one part of the mystery remained. How could both the pastry and the hamburger become poisoned with the germs of salmonella? And as we drove up in front of the stores and parked, an almost forgotten item of my medical training popped into my mind. I was sure I had the answer. Well, as we gathered in my laboratory a little later, Sandy, Jill, Dr. Jarvis, and myself, we were a happy gang. There wouldn't be any more cases of food poisoning from that source, at least. Lost in thought, I heard Sandy ask... But gee, Dr. Tim, how come you went right into those stores and started looking for rats? He sure fooled me. Well, as Dr. Jarvis could tell you as well as I, one of the commonest carriers of salmonella, the food poisoning bug, is rats and mice. A few of their droppings around the food store and, well, you've seen what happens. Oh, well, that's why we have inspections by the city and campaigns against rats and mice. Even if you can't get results 100% of the time. Well, why would just the, well, the cream filling in the hamburger be full of germs? Well, you remember what I told you about cultures? The perfect material for bacteria to grow on? Yeah. Sure. Well, two of the best cultures in the world for salmonella are cream fillings and ground meat. Especially in a warm place like the bakery. Or when left outside the refrigerator in a butcher shop. It's the perfect setup for an epidemic like ours. But why do those stores being right together give you the idea? Elementary, my dear Sandy, elementary. It would be rather strange that two or three different sets of food poisoning would break out on the same day at widely separated spots. So figuring that adjoining buildings would offer plenty of opportunity for the same carriers to go back and forth freely, I apprehended the poisoners at large. It's a matter of get rid of the rats, get rid of the poisoners. And believe me, that's going to be done. <laughs> This is Dr. Tim, detective, to bring you by transcription, The Mystery of the Man from Hiroshima. Even doctors have to do their spring house cleaning once a year. And on this particular day, my laboratory looked as if a cyclone had hit it. I'd enlisted the aid of Sandy and Jill, my two best friends and helpers, and hired a man to wash the walls and woodwork and do some painting. It wasn't until we were in the middle of the job that I remembered that I'd promised to get those X-ray pictures out by the next day. They were going to be pretty important in a murder trial at which I was testifying, and my good friend the district attorney wanted to go over the pictures with me at the earliest moment. Ordinarily, I would have developed them at once, but an emergency case prevented me. 
As I was scrambling in the litter of house cleaning, trying to remember where I'd put the film, Mr. Tagawa, the man who was helping us, stopped to light a cigarette. Did you lose something, Dr. Tim? Yeah, you wouldn't remember where you put that package of exposed x-ray film, would you? I think I know where it is. Good. Uh, Jill, if you'd like to take a few minutes off from your drudgery and help me in the dark room, the job's yours. Sure. Are we going to develop some more x-ray pictures? If I can find them in this confounded mess. Are these the ones you wanted? Uh, let's see, Sandy. No, no, this is a new package. It hasn't been opened. I think this is perhaps what you look for, Doctor. I have, with much carelessness, put my coat on top of it when I start to work. Oh, thanks, Mr. Tagawa. You know, most people wouldn't even know what a package of X-ray film looked like. Before, in Japan, I have done many tasks in scientific laboratory. Then great Scott, man. Surely you don't have to do this sort of work for a living. Heck no, I'll bet Dr. Kim could get you a job. I am very grateful, but I have not been well. And also, I have run into much prejudice because of my unfortunate nationality. But he was, Mr. Tagawa. I thought you were an American soldier in the war. That is quite correct, Miss Jill. I was an American intelligence officer and was captured as a prisoner by the Japanese. I served 18 months as prisoner in Japan. You will excuse, please. I have about finished cleaning wall and must buy paint to start on woodwork tomorrow. Yes? Taking Jill with me, I waved goodbye to Mr. Tagawa and disappeared into the dark room. Not even realizing that clutched in my hand, in a thin cardboard box, was the beginning of one of the most baffling mysteries in my career as doctor and detective. About an hour later, Sandy, Jill, and I stood dumbfounded before a rack on my laboratory bench upon which were spread the developed x-ray pictures. But there's absolutely nothing on them. What do you suppose could have happened? I'll be dark con. They look as if they'd been light struck, I guess. Well, I must have been careless, or else the x-ray machine is out of order. Well, but it couldn't be, Dr. Tim. Don't you remember those pictures we took yesterday? After these, they were okay. I'd show if I'd forgotten. They were. That's a mystery to me. What did you have to do? Take them over, I guess. I'd better get the DA on the phone. Boy, that sure beats everything. By working most of the night, I managed to get the x-rays taken again, and I developed about half of them before I had to give up and go to sleep. I was awakened early the next morning by the arrival of Mr. Tagawa, who started laying out his painting equipment, and by the entrance of Sandy and Jill, ready to start the day's work. I dressed quickly and joined them. What about the new set of pictures? Were they okay? Well, they were, Jill. At least the ones I developed last night. I wonder what could have happened. It uh, beats me, Sandy. We'll soon know about the rest. Well, where did I put right those? Right here, Dr. Kim. Oh. Shall I take him to the dark room? No, just hang on them a minute. I, I think... Like color for wood, Doctor? Oh. Yeah, yeah, that looks okay to me. I make darker or lighter you like. Oh, I like that, Mr. Tagawa. Looks well to me. Here, let me hold wood sample against light color. You give me a box of film a minute, yes? Very nice, I think. He held the box against his chest and stepped back for us to see. Well... When I walked out of the dark room a short time later, I tried to keep from swearing where the kids could hear me. The last half of those pictures were fogged again, completely ruined as if by light. As Sandy, Jill, and I sat over breakfast at the drugstore in the corner, we were a puzzling crew. You don't suppose I could have done something wrong, do you? No, of course not. I was working in there with you all the time, Jill. Well, you didn't expose them to any light, and you checked the x-ray machine. Is there anything besides light that would spoil them? No. Well, that is nothing that could possibly be in the laboratory. What do you mean? Of course, film can be spoiled if it's exposed to radium, but I've never had radium or any radium product in the lab. I don't get it. About radium, I mean. Well, radium gives off light, Sandy. Invisible light. I mean, it's invisible to us, but it's there all right. So do other atomic products, things they're making at places like Oak Ridge. In the atom bomb factory? It's much more than that, Jill. Our atomic scientists are working for medicine, too. You know how radium is used in stopping the growth of cancer in the human body? Uh -huh. Sure. Well, certain other chemicals are made radioactive, too. They're used just like tracer bullets from a machine gun. Oh. Well, take iodine, for instance. There's a certain important gland in the body that's called the thyroid gland. Well, iodine taken into the body sooner or later goes to the thyroid. So doctors these days are using iodine, which has been made radioactive, to study what actually happens to it in the body, especially in the thyroid gland. Oh, I get it. 
Vicky is really in proud to give us that invisible light while you can take X-ray pictures of the iodine at work in this by thyroid. Exactly. Doesn't radium kill you? Too much does, Sandy. And too much means a piece less than the size of a grain of salt. But doctors use it for brief periods, just like X-ray, to cure people. Well, let's get back to those spoiled pictures. Hey, you sure you haven't got some of that stuff around in the lab? And you've forgotten about it? Now, look, kids. Well, it was a thought. And it was a thought. Not that I'd had any radioactive material around, for it's the most dangerous stuff in the world when handled carelessly. But I remembered a case or two I'd read about. Not so long ago, thousands of rolls of unused film had been spoiled because the containers they came in had been made of contaminated material. That's a word scientists use to describe any substance which has been exposed to the deadly rays of atomic products. And there was the famous case years ago of the workers in a clock factory which manufactured those clocks and watches with luminous dials that glow in the dark because they moistened the tiny brushes with their tongues. Some of them died of radium poisoning. So it wasn't so far-fetched after all that something in that laboratory might be radioactive enough to spoil the X-ray film. Meantime, I had to take half those pictures over again. I sighed and started back to work. Mr. Tagawa had gone when we got back, as it was Saturday, and he worked only half a day. Wearily, I called my patient back and retook the pictures. And this time, they were all right, as sharp and clean and unfogged as you could ask for. Here was a mystery with a vengeance. It was Jill who made a bright suggestion as we finished. Dr. Tim, isn't there some way you can tell us something's here that shouldn't be? Like radium or something? Well, yes, there is. We could use a Geiger counter. Sure, I've read about those. They use them in the atom bomb test. They go beep, beep, beep if there's anything around that's radioactive. Well, you said about the paint in the clock factory. Maybe Mr. Tagawa's paint got radioactive. Uh, it's not likely, but... No, no, that wouldn't work. Because those first films were spoiled before he even bought the paint. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, why don't we get one of those Geiger counters? And... Sandy, I believe you have the answer. I'll call the physics laboratory out at the university and we'll go to work. I don't think we'll find anything, but it's worth a try. On Sunday, we spent three hours going over the laboratory for traces of radiation. There were none, except when I showed Sandy and Jill how the Geiger counter worked. I turned on my X-ray and pointed the machine toward it. The counter began to click away like mad. Well, I'll be darned. Oh, I get it. The faster the clicks, the more dangerous the radi radiation, huh? Yes. But there's not a trace of anything in the whole room that could have caused those films to be exposed. Just a bad batch, I guess. Looks that way. Unless... Oh, but that's silly. What's that, Jim? Well... Well, you said people could be radioactive, too. Wouldn't they spoil the film? If... My jaw dropped open as I had a sudden thought as clear as day. Now, hold on, I told myself. Let me think. My handyman and painter had given me the box with the first spoiled films himself, after his coat had lain on them. Yes, I was right. When I took the pictures over, I'd developed half of them that night. No one but myself had touched them. But the next morning, the paint sample, Tagawa had held a strip of wood in the box that held the remainder of the film against his clothes. But the idea was fantastic. I was jolted out of my reverie by someone at the door. I'll see who it is. Why not bother? I, I'd like to see if paint dry okay. Mr. Tagawa, would you help us with an experiment? I glad to give assistance. Sandy, will you hand me the Geiger counter? Thanks. Ah, that is equipment I'm much familiar with. I'm glad of that, Mr. Tagawa. Because if you do have radium poisoning, I won't have to tell you what it means. Gosh. You don't mean it was, Mr. Tagawa. Not Mr. Tagawa. His clothes. But if his clothes are contaminated, there's a chance that he, too, might... I... I'm much afraid of that, Doctor. For a long time, I not feel well. Look pale. How did you guess? The film you held against your coat. It was spoiled. I'm sorry, please. Good Lord, man. You've nothing to be sorry for. I only wish that we, we doctors, could... I understand. No cure. Just what I work on in Japan. 
I see what happened to so many. It's very funny that I too should Miss have... Miss What is he saying? When I prisoner, Miss Jill, I take to Hiroshima. Hiroshima? Holy gee, when the bomb was dropped? No, I said after. The Japanese, they know I am laboratory technician. I still a prisoner, but I work. I work with all doctors to find out what have happened, what can be done for all those people. Naturally, you handled a lot of contaminated material. Yes, and I think we're going to die. How how you know this, Doctor? Well, it takes months, sometimes years, for the effects to show up. But your clothes gave me the clue. You wore them at that time? Yes, these old clothes have been in my footlocker, you know. It's a army trunk. Since I come back from Japan, till a few days ago, I'm very sad that something so good, the little tracer bullets of you doctors, the radium for the cancer, the marvelous picture of the inside of the body, are very sad it also be so bad. I mean, the bomb. Well, gee, it won't always be that way. You test me now, doctor? Yes. Breathe out now. Silently, I held the counter so he breathed upon it. There were a few faint clicks. Oh, Dr. Kim, can't you do something for Mr. Tagawa? Anything? Oh, it isn't fair. No, Jill, not a thing as yet. By the time you and Sandy are grown up, maybe. That's up to you what you want to do with this power we own. Good or evil. Yes, you will be the ones. I think I go now, yes. This is great shock. Although I suspect before. I take the paint tomorrow. Many happy landing. And so we close my casebook on the mystery of the man from Hiroshima. The last program of this first series. This is Dr. Tim, Detective, saying so long for now. The series was written and directed by Jack Weir Lewis and produced and transcribed by the Monarch Program Library, Incorporated. Welcome back. Well, it was interesting in the first episode, we get a little bit of a response to those who are like, what is Dr. Tim doing relying so much on these kids for help as assistants? Dr. Tim offers a good explanation, and I'm sure that their work ethic's fine. It may be a situation where A kid calls up and says he's with the Department of Health that you might be uh, less than willing to cooperate. But again, I think this falls well within the suspension of disbelief. And I think the episode does a good job of explaining kind of a logical thought process to work through this entire situation. And to start with a lot of potential clauses and then to really narrow it down based on evidence as well as on medical knowledge. The Man from Hiroshima was a different type of episode. While we don't have all the episodes of the series, we have seven of the other twelve and generally everything turns out fine. 
that's not the case here. I'll be honest that I found the fate of Mr. Tagawa to be quite sad, and no doubt kids who identified with Jill felt just as bad as she did about Dr. Tim being unable to help him. But it did go towards this larger point of the episode. The discovery of atomic power, of the many potential scientific applications of that knowledge both stirred people's imaginations, but also their darkest fears. And the ending of the episode really reflects that dichotomy. Dr. Tim leaves it to Jill and to Sandy and to all the kids in their generation. The question of how this will be used and whether this will benefit mankind or will bring more pain and suffering. And it's a very serious thought to end on for a series that I think had been relatively light and fun even with the educational lessons thrown in. The writer of the series, Jack Weir Lewis, would write another old-time radio series called This is Civil Defense that was also syndicated and put out by the Rocky Mountain Radio Council. I've not listened to it, but according to uh, Radio Gold Index, Edward R. Murrow does appear in the first episode. Well, listener comments and feedback now, and uh, we have a comment from Emmett over at greatdetectives.net uh, regarding the series. This show is better than I had expected. It's a pity that television and radio, let's forget about the internet, which is not for children, lack any stories that taught valuable lessons. This show is a bit heavy-handed, but it really was meant for kids. Too bad there are only a few episodes to be found. Well, I would uh, definitely agree, Emmett, that it's too bad that there are not more episodes of the series, though there are only 13 in total. So we're only missing five, and if any of those do come into circulation, we'll certainly revisit them. As to programs that taught valuable lessons, I actually think there have been quite a few series over the years that have tried to do that. They got to hunt for them. And I think it can be a struggle to find them among the latest radio and television program. But there are lessons if you're willing to listen to them. Well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Catherine, Patreon supporter since June of 2021, currently supporting the program at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Catherine. And that will do it for today. A reminder, if you want to be sure and never miss an episode, you can follow our podcast on your favorite podcast software, including Google Podcast, the iHeartRadio app, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. And if you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back on next Tuesday with Meet Miss Sherlock. But join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... It is a pleasure to welcome you, Mr. Mitchell. I hope you will be able to help us get to the bottom of this mystifying affair. Well, I'll give it the old school try, Lieutenant. First, I would like you to meet Dalmud. I am honored, Mr. Mitchell. Dalmud? Dalmud is Tokat's assistant. I arranged for him to be here to give you such information as he possesses. I see. Now, as I understand it, Dalmud... Your boss, Joseph Tokat, was head of intelligence here and was on the trail of the leader of the spy ring that's been operating throughout the Middle East? That is correct. It is our theory, of course, that he was getting close to this person and was blown up in his automobile for that reason. Yeah. Did he give you any indication as to who he thought he was after? Not much. Tokat was a very brilliant agent, but very close-mouthed. He preferred to operate alone. He did mention to me that he was not sure whether this person was a man or woman, but that is all he said. Which, unfortunately, does not give us much to go on. No, it sure doesn't, Lieutenant Balik. Uh, look, Dalmud, how about uh, Tokat's files? Did you find anything there that might give us a lead? Unfortunately, no. In his confidential files is a folder pertaining to the investigation he was undertaking at the time of his murder. But it is 
just general information. Uh, one sheet of paper had been torn out, however. Probably the sheet that pegs the killer. Well, looks like we're getting nowhere fast. Incidentally, can either of you tell me how this guy Sam and his trained seal figure in this deal? We know only that Tokat's car was parked three blocks from the theater where the trained seal performs. And that Tokat is supposed to have attended the performance the night of his murder. So what? That isn't much of a tie-in. But since the murder, Mitchell, there have been several attempts on the life of this Sam, the seal's trainer. Oh, well, maybe that throws a new light on things. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.